Can everyone hear me better? Hello? Hello? I'm sorry. We're good? All right, very good. Made my heart really glad being here uh, this evening. Uh, you guys kind of made my week. Uh, just hearing the children, uh, you know, recommend hymns to sing, that just really made my heart really glad. This is Psalm 6. People of God, hear God's word for you this evening. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my my bed with my tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Let us pray for God's blessing on his word. (coughs) Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not a mute God. You are not the God that the magicians go to with conjuring and tricks and spells to try to eke words out of you, but you are the God who has lavishly, graciously, lovingly spoken in his word. And we ask for your blessing upon the reading as well as the exhortation from this word that comes here this evening. And we pray that you would build your people up in love, that we may see Christ all the more, love him, love the salvation he has wrought for us so that your church may be edified and grown until you return. And we pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Once a week, my wife and I watch a a show called Little House on the Prairie. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you know this show or probably even grew up watching it yourselves. But for those of you who don't know this show, it's about a family who, who lives in the frontier of America, in, in Minnesota specifically, during the late 1800s, and tells of all the adventures, all the ups and downs that this family went through. There's this one episode that we recently watched where a child drowns in a nearby lake while playing with the uh, daughters of the main family. After the funeral... The town minister comes to visit the mother of the child who drowned. Though the minister tries to comfort her with God's word, she is just so distraught that she just yells at the minister that God must be angry with her and kicks the minister out of her home. Have you experienced something like this? Where it feels as if God is displeased with you, God has abandoned you or or turned his back on you either because of your sin or because of the suffering that you're facing. I have a friend back in California who for years suffered with an unexplainable, undiagnosable burning pain all throughout his body. And when I would visit him to comfort him, he would ask me, why is this happening to me? Is God punishing me for something? For David in this psalm, it's not clear exactly as to why David feels like this, why he came to write this psalm in the first place. It may have been because he committed a sin as the king of Israel, or it may have been because of the circumstances that he was facing. Nevertheless, God feels as though God is displeased with him, as though God has turned his back toward David. But this 
ambiguity here, uh, the, how this psalm <clears throat> is not specific as to why David felt like this, is so that every believer in every age can sing this psalm uh, no matter the circumstance. They can cry it no, ma- no matter the circumstance. We can sing this psalm when we are stricken with the grief of sin that that clings so close to us. We can even sing this psalm when when the external circumstances of our lives, like suffering, feels like it's more than we can bear. Or it's because we're we're, we're tempted to think that God is displeased with us for some reason. And tonight, let us remember that our Heavenly Father saves and provides for those who cry out to Him. Our Heavenly Father saves and provides for those who cry out to Him. And we're just going to look at this psalm in just two simple parts. And I'm sure many of you saw this kind of division yourself. First is David's humiliation and grief. And then second, we're going to look at David's exaltation and hope. We see in the first part of this psalm, verses 1 through 7, what Martin Lloyd-Jones calls spiritual depression. Spiritual depression. Here we see David using vivid language to describe how he feels. He uses language like languishing, his bones and soul being troubled, his eyes wasting away because of grief. It is a spiritual state where a child of God feels as though God, his heavenly father, is displeased or even angry. And that is why David cries out to the Lord, pleading with God that he does not rebuke him in anger or discipline him in his wrath. Now, those words there, anger and wrath, show for us how David sees his God right now in a time of spiritual depression. David sees the the true sinfulness of himself so clearly. We don't know the nature of David's sin here, but it's something that rocks him to his very core. He describes himself as languishing, so much so that his bones are troubled. Some people think here that David has some sort of physical illness. But I think David describes his bones here to show how deep the grief of his sin affects him. David feels as if the most structural and stable aspect of his body, the the bone that gives his body form, is affected by the weight of sin. The same idea is even more emphasized when he says that his soul is greatly troubled. And because the guilt of his sin affects him so deeply, he knows for a fact that all that his sins deserve would be an angry rebuke and a wrathful discipline from the Lord. We can say one thing for certain here from this plea. David has a very high and holy view of God. Do we? Before we think about the grace of God offered in Jesus Christ, have we first meditated and even trembled regarding the holiness of God and what we sinners deserve in light of it? If we do, then the words out of our mouths would be the same as David's. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. But this very plea here, that David, gave, that David gives at the beginning of this psalm not only highlights God's holiness and, and the absolute moral perfection of his divine being, but it also highlights how God has demonstrated and revealed his graciousness and mercy towards sinners like you and me. David would not give this plea had he not also known that God would also hear his plea that God would truly be gracious to him. David, aware of his guilt before God, simply wants to know that that God is for him. We can actually infer from the words here 
that he is willing to be rebuked and disciplined, just not in divine anger and wrath. He wants to be rebuked and disciplined, not as an enemy, but as a child of the living God. He wants to be rebuked and disciplined in love. The author of Hebrews was very aware uh, that, that God, as our loving Heavenly Father, disciplines whom He loves. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6. <clears throat> My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises the son whom He receives. <clears throat> I look back at my own earthly parents and my own uh, childhood and see that the discipline that they gave me wasn't because that they hated me uh, as some sort of enemy, but because they loved me. I look back and think, yeah, I needed that discipline. And that's what David is yearning to know during his spiritual depression, that God loves him and is for him in every circumstance. <clears throat> Now, some can ask, after reading this psalm, can a true believer actually feel like this? Can a true believer actually go through spiritual depression? And God's word says to us this evening, yes. A true child of God can face spiritual depression at times. We actually hear of notable Christians throughout church history who could very much relate uh, with David here in this psalm. Martin Luther, John Bunyan, William Cooper, and Charles Spurgeon. But, but the spiritual depression of David and the saints is not a depression that surrenders to the despair, but one that is deeply saturated with faith in God whom we know at the end of the day is love. The God whom we know as gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. It is because David's despair at the moment is still woven deeply together with his faith in God that the entirety of his plea is directed toward the God that he ultimately knows hears him. And yet, In his anxiety and and weight, he cried out to the Lord in this psalm, How long? But you, O Lord, how long? And there's nothing wrong with asking God that question. It is a humble and honest question to the Lord. We actually even see the, the martyred saints in heaven, who enjoy the presence of Jesus right now, crying out to the Lord in Revelation 6, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? A true child of God, whether in heaven right now in the immediate presence of Jesus or even in spiritual depression, is still desperate to know when will everything be made right. That's a good desire and yearning, isn't it? That's why it's good to cry out to the Lord how long, whether you struggle with the sin that clings so close to you or or because of the sufferings that God has ordained in your life. Verse 4 continues David's plea, asking the Lord for, for, for an active work in his life. He says, turn, O Lord, deliver my life. The Hebrew word here for turn is better translated as return or turn back, as the KJV puts it. Return, turn back, O Lord, deliver my life. This again shows how David sees the Lord right now in his spiritual depression. It feels as if God has truly turned his back on him. And now David asks his heavenly father to turn back to him in favor and love. This child of God throws himself on God's mercy alone because because there's no one else who can protect him, forgive him, and love him as God does. Jesus' disciples shared the same heart 
when they said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There was nowhere else that David could go. There was nowhere else that David wanted to go. Nowhere else that David could find true life, forgiveness, and peace. And on the basis of God's mercy, David asks for deliverance of his life. He sees a very real threat of death upon him in this psalm. And this threat is at the hands of the workers of evil, given in verse 8, who are most likely the unbelieving nations and their armies uh, that, that surround Israel during David's reign. In the Old Testament, we see often how these nations harassed and persecuted God's people. David feels as if his earthly enemies lie at the city gate waiting to kill him. And as the threat of death lies so close to David, he he gives a reason why the Lord should save him. Verse 5, For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? Now, this is a rather challenging verse to think through. What does David mean here? He does not think, he does not think that he is going to hell, nor does he think that there is no resurrection of the body or that, there, that death is some unconscious state. But, but knowing the spiritual depression that David is in at the moment, he has a very narrow and skewed view of death. He can't see further than his own life and situation at the moment. He sees death as the end all. And if death is the end all, then David can no longer remember the Lord, no longer give the Lord praise. And I think we can very much empathize with David here. Have you ever been so stressed uh, and weary in your heart and mind that you just don't think clearly and throw out the comforts and promises of God given in the Bible. Sometimes I do myself. David is so distraught here with his sin, his guilt before the Lord, and the prospect of impending death, that the darkness of death and sin is all that he sees. If David were to die, if the Lord were not to deliver him from sin and death, then no longer would the song of praise come out of his mouth. And now, we must go one level deeper in verses 6 and 7 before we go into the hope and exaltation of of David. For those of you who have experienced great grief, the the words of David here may ring familiar. Verses 6 and 7. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Can you imagine David, the king of Israel, weeping with nothing held back? This kind of weeping in these verses show exactly how deep his grief affected him. The the trouble of his bones mentioned earlier in in the psalm, and the trouble of his soul welled up into an unceasing spring in his eyes, filled with bitter tears. His eyes wasted away as if he couldn't see anymore because the stream of tears impaired his vision. And to be honest with you, I rarely repent like this. I rarely repent with, if ever, with tears that soak my bed and my pillows. I so rarely grieve for my sins like this, but but this brings us back to how highly and terribly David saw God's holiness. Though we may not repent like this, it does cause us to pause and to think, how grievously do we consider our sins? Do we consider the greatness of the guilt and grief that sin brings about in us when standing before the judgment seat of God? 
Of course, I'm not saying that we should cry every day when repenting of our sins, but, but David is showing through his tears here the believer's heart and repentance. But David's tears could not compare to the grief and trouble that our Lord Jesus bore in his life, most pointedly shown when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Gospel of Mark really paints well the troubled state of our Lord Jesus vividly in Mark 14. And he, Jesus, took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is sorrowful, even to death. Perhaps Jesus himself was singing Psalm 6 in the garden as part of his prayers to the Father. But these troubles and distresses that Jesus bore in his soul was not for his own sin, like it was for David in the psalm, but for your sins and mine. Jesus loved David. Jesus loves you to the point of bearing God's anger and wrath upon himself with his soul troubled like no soul, human soul had been troubled before so that you may be delivered and saved for the sake of God's steadfast love. Jesus was rebuked in anger for our sins. He was disciplined in wrath for our sins. And as the Holy Spirit inspired these words through the pen of David, it was all pointing to the grief of soul that Jesus would go through for you and me. David's humiliation and darkness ultimately points to the humiliation of our Lord Jesus. The whole of his life, suffering and death. But our Jesus is not an eternally suffering Jesus, nor is he lying eternally in the grave. We gather together this Lord's day because he is risen. He is victorious over death and all of sin's miseries. And this is the, the, the hinge on which all of redemption and hope turns. Jesus' resurrection is the hinge that turns humiliation to exaltation. David not only shadows Jesus' humiliation, but he also shadows Jesus' exaltation uh, when we see in verse 8, Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. For, for those of us familiar with the Psalms, there are often these, these turns of mood where the psalm writer turns from grief and despair to hope and joy. But, but the turn of mood here in Psalm 6 is more jarring than it is in other psalms. He goes straight to addressing his enemies. And why is that? This first goes to show what was mentioned before, how intertwined David's grief was with his faith. It was a grief that, that kept looking to the Lord of salvation. David never looked away. But one commentator notes something in this jarring change of mood, and it is this. God not only works in the great extravagant ways, but he also works in the quiet. In the quiet. In the inmost recesses of our souls to bring about true spiritual comfort. Just as how we don't know the specifics as to what da caused David's grief, we also don't know exactly what, go uh, what God said or what God did to David or for David that now causes this new confidence and hope. This abrupt change from the deepest valley to the highest height here in verse 8 without any explicit reference as to what God did or what he has done shows us the invisible work of the Spirit. The, the work where, where he takes the promising words of God and sovereignly molds our hearts to look like that of Christ. Perhaps you have experienced something like 
whether you were just a sheer unbeliever for a time or in a time of spiritual depression yourself. One day, you just got it. You understood what your sin means to our God. You understood the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. You understood that the promises of God are for you. There, are, there was no outward pomp and circumstance that, that surrounded that moment. It was quiet. And suddenly, in a moment, it just clicked for you. Or perhaps you felt like, or you currently feel like David does here, tossing and turning in your bed, languishing before the Lord because of the conviction of your sin or the suffering that you bear. But let this jarring change of tone here in verse 8 encourage you. God is working quietly in you now just as powerfully as he does in all things. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that caused the persecuting Paul to see and believe in Jesus Christ is the same power that works in your grieving heart now, no matter your sin or circumstance. The work of the Holy Spirit is often quiet and undetectable, but it brings about sure fruit in our lives, fruits of confidence, hope, assurance, and peace. And this is what David experienced and what God promises to those who call out to him now. Looking at David's exaltation in verses 8 to 10, uh, we, we see this great confidence because he repeats three times that the Lord, that, that, that God has Open, uh, listen to his cries. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. This silent yet divine work of the Lord in David's heart has produced this firm assurance that the Lord has heard him. Brothers and sisters, you can have the same confidence and assurance that God has heard the sound of your weeping. He has heard your plea. He has accepted your prayer, all because of the sure work of Jesus Christ for you. And that's what Paul is saying to us in 2 Corinthians 1. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That, it is, that is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. To close, there are two things I want us to see when David talks about his enemies here in verses 8 to 10. David, in his newfound hope, calls his enemies to depart from him. During David's reign, there would be no major incursion into Jerusalem by Israel's enemies. God was the one who protected Jerusalem's walls in David's life. And when the better David, the king of kings cried out this psalm. His father heard him. Satan and his minions could not finally win because Jesus was raised by the Father in all righteousness and glory. The Father truly heard the sound of his son's weeping. He heard Jesus' plea and accepted his prayer. And now, as Jesus has been exalted at the right hand of the Father, he reigns even over his enemies, issuing a curse to them because they are at enmity with God. And on the last day, Jesus will pronounce the words of Psalm 6, 8 to his enemies because he said so in Luke 13. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And what's even scarier is that this curse is not for those outside the church, but for those inside the visible church. Jesus' curse here are, are, are for those who said, Lord, Lord, to him, and those who prophesy 
cast out demons, and did mighty works in Jesus' name. But these workers of evil did not have hearts toward Jesus, hearts that threw themselves into the mercy of God and Jesus Christ. But Jesus says to you, for all those in this room who are enemies of the living God, that as long as it is called today, His mercy is offered to you now. We actually see this in the very last verse of this psalm. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Now, at first glance, uh, the words here in verse 10 seems like it has the same tone as it does in verse 8. But I want you to compare verse 10 with God's amazing words in Ezekiel 36. And I will read that passage for you now. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. And I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominations." It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. The shame that, that would be for, should be for God's pagan enemies is attributed, it describes God's own people in Ezekiel 36. But it is a shame that leads to life and godliness. Not death and condemnation. It is when the Spirit gives new life and a new heart that people see their evil ways and deeds and are ashamed for committing them. And more than that, we as people united to Jesus don't live with shame any longer. All that shame was put on Jesus so that you would never have to bear that shame again. So when we see in the last verse of Psalm 6 of all of God's enemies being ashamed and, and put to shame, it is also a call for God's enemies to repent and come to Jesus. Shame for our past and evil deeds and relief from that shame are actually gifts from God because they point to the new life that we have in Christ. And so what will it be for you? Will you be ashamed today because you have come to trust in Christ and now abhor your sin? Or will you be ashamed on that last day? when Jesus himself casts you out of his presence for eternity. Come, come to Jesus. But there's one final point of application I would like to leave with you. Thinking about the spiritual depression that, that David goes through here in this psalm, let us not think that we should cry out, only to, you know, cry out to, to God only in the really big things of life. We should cry out to God in all the little things as well. You know, when a toddler uh, runs out of water in his sippy cup or, or snacks, um, he calls out to his father for more. And the father knows that the child can't get more water or snacks by, him or by himself. And, and, and are we so different with our Heavenly Father? If we really think of it, what can we really do without God's blessing 
and grace. Apart from him, we can't do anything. God shows through this psalm the childlike faith of David and of all believers. We can cry out to him in the small things and the big things and everything in between. So, are you dreading going to work tomorrow? Cry out to him. Are you worried about how you're going to homeschool your children, perhaps, this week? Cry out to him. Are you in a valley of spiritual depression and you want to know God's favor for you? Cast yourself on Jesus. He will surely hear your prayer. Brothers and sisters, our Heavenly Father surely saves and cares for those who cry out to Him. Let us go to our God in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we know we are weak and we know we are sinful. And we ask that you would give us the strength, you would give us the awareness and the conviction that we should cry out to you and know that you hear us, not for our sake, but for Christ's sake alone. Because he was the one who bore all the penalty for our sins. He was the one who, uh, who was disciplined in anger and rebuked in wrath. But Lord, we now know that in Christ, this anger and wrath is not toward us, but Father, your love is now toward us. Hear us in all our weaknesses, in all our valleys. May we come to you in matters big and small and everything in between. And would you do all of these things for Christ's sake. Amen.